There is stood in the midst of you one whom you know not. St. John the Baptist said this in today's gospel to the delegation that was sent from the Pharisees to ascertain who St. John the Baptist was. He was causing a lot of trouble. He was getting a lot of attention, stirring up a lot of people, and the Pharisees wanted to know who he was. Now, as St. John said, there is one who has stood in the midst of you whom you do not know. Obviously, at this time, our Lord had indeed walked in the midst of them, but at this time could not be faulted. It could not be faulted that the Jews did not recognize Christ because Christ led a hidden private life until shortly after this. So it could not be, the Jews could not be blamed for not having recognized him. But after he made his appearance and after he went about teaching, working miracles, giving an example of holiness, um, improving himself to be the promised redeemer, their unbelief, their rejection of Christ could no longer be excused. All they had to do was apply the prophecies that had been made in the Old Testament and they would have had to recognize that Christ was truly the Messiah, the Redeemer. Last week we had talked about the types, the prefigurements of Christ in the Old Testament. And today we're going to talk about some of the prophecies that were made concerning the Redeemer. Regarding his coming, regarding his life, his sufferings and his death, and also regarding his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and his church, which was to have, which was to endure until the end of the world. The prophets, if you add them all up together, there were over 300 prophecies made about Christ. And he fulfilled every single one of them. These were not just, not only just general vague prophecies, but also very specific, mentioning time and place and details that could not possibly known, be known to anyone but God. 1,700 years before Christ, Jacob, blessing his son Judah, said that the scepter shall not be taken away from Judah, nor a ruler from his thigh, till he come that is to be sent, and he shall be the expectation of nations. This prophecy that was made you can find in the book of Genesis, foretells that the Messiah would not come until the reign, the scepter, the kingship, which was of the tribe of Judah, would be taken away and given to a foreigner. And that's exactly what happened. The kingship was taken away from Judah, his tribe, and was given over to someone who is not of the tribe of Judah, someone who is not even of the Jewish race, as the Roman emperors, Caesar Augustus, ruled over them. And then Herod was later installed as king, but he was not of the tribe of Judah. This was foretold 1,700 years before Christ. Prophet Daniel, who lived 500 years before Christ, specified even more accurately when the coming of Christ would occur. While in prayer one day, the angel Gabriel appeared to him and revealed to him that from the rebuilding of the, the temple in Jerusalem, that there would elapse, what he said, 69 weeks of years. 69 times 7 is 483. And he said other details about the, with regard to weeks and years, with regard to Christ being put to death, and also with regard to the destruction of Jerusalem and the passing of the rejection of the Jews by Almighty God. This was fulfilled to the very year. For we know that the Jews were permitted to return and rebuild Jerusalem. The, um, and there were exactly, as I said, 483 years from that point to the appearance of Christ and his public life. And likewise, it was prophesied by Daniel the timing of the destruction of Jerusalem, the rejection of the Jewish people, the ending of the sacrifices of the Old Testament, of the, co of the Old Covenant. 
The place of our Lord's birth was foretold by the prophet Micaeus, who said, And thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, art a little one among the thousands of Judah. Out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel. And his going forth is from the beginning, from the days of eternity. Reference, not only, reference there not only to Bethlehem being the place of his birth, but also that the Messiah was to be God. For his going forth is from the days of eternity. That cannot be said of anyone but Almighty God. So also in the, uh, the prayers that we pray for Advent, that first invocation, that first excerpt from one of the prophecies, drop down dew from above ye heavens, and let the clouds rain the just one. Let the earth be open and bud forth the Savior. This points out that the Messiah would come down from heaven. It would be as rain coming down from heaven. But the earth would bud forth the Savior. This specifically mentions that the Messiah would be God and man. The prophets also foretold many other circumstances concerning the coming of the Messiah. That he would be descended from the line of David, as is mentioned in the Psalms, that as Isaiah foretold, he would be born of a virgin. A virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. At his birth, kings would come from afar, from the east, bringing gifts. Isaiah foretold this, and they would adore him, not only recognizing him as a Messiah, but offering him adoration, which is due only to God. On his account, as Jeremiah foretold, the children of Bethlehem and the surrounding area would be killed. And so there would be great weeping and lamentation, great sorrow. This is, of course, was fulfilled when Herod put to death all of the boys that were two years and younger, trying to snuff out the Messiah. He would go into Egypt, as the prophet Osi foretold, and that he would come out again. As we know, the Holy Family fled to Egypt, as, was, as they were bidden to by the angel, so that they would escape that massacre of Herod. With regard to his life, his sufferings, and his death, it's foretold by Isaiah and by Malachi that he would have a precursor, Someone who would come and prepare the way. And this is what St. John the Baptist references in the gospel today. A voice of one crying in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. That precursor would come and prepare the people by penance to uh, accept the Messiah when he was to come. Isaiah speaks about the office of Christ saying that he would preach truth and justice, not breaking the bruised reed nor quenching the smoking flax, not being, not approaching others with, in, um, uh, out of, and getting them to accept him out of fear, but out of goodness, out of kindness, out of gentleness. He would heal the contrite of heart, preach release to captives and deliverance to them that are shut up. He would perform many miracles, as Isaiah prophesied. God himself will come and save you. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And, the, and then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall be set free. Again, this is Isaiah. You know, over and over again, we see this refrain repeated, that with regard to the Messiah, he would be God. God himself would come and save us. His name would be Emmanuel, God with us. Over and over again, this is repeated. So in claiming to be the Messiah, by that fact, Christ claimed to be God. You know, some of the Jews today reject the idea that the Messiah was to be God. Or the Muslims say that Christ never claimed to be God and he's just a prophet. And that is not true at all. That goes against all of the Old Testament prophecies and also against the claims which Christ himself made in, in the gospel accounts, and also what we read in the book of Apocalypse when Christ spoke to St. John, claiming to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the first and the last, very clearly claiming to be God. 
The sufferings and the death of our, of our Lord were foretold in such detail that it's absolutely incredible. If you look in the book of Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 21. What is said in that Psalm, Psalm 21, speaks so clearly about what happened in our Lord's passion and death that when you compare that with the gospel of St. John and the other evangelists, you're looking at them side by side. They're almost identical in so many respects, even to the, the very words that the Pharisees addressed to Christ. Prophet Zachary and in the Psalms mentioned that he would be valued at 30 pieces of silver and would be betrayed. Exactly what Judas did. Isaiah said that he would be despised, mock, struck, and spit upon. And our Lord himself prophesied that this would happen before they went up to Jerusalem. He would be a worm and no man, the reproach of men and the outcast of the people from the Psalms. He shall be wounded so terribly that he shall be thought as a leper, as one stricken by God and afflicted from Isaiah. This makes us think of how Pilate brought forth Christ after he had been scourged and said, Behold the man. Yes, this is a man standing before you. He's so beaten and so disfigured by these torments that yes, he is indeed a man. He shall be reputed with the wicked. They shall give him gall and vinegar to drink. They shall pierce his hands and feet. Not a bone of him shall be broken. He shall be laughed to scorn and people will say, He hoped in the Lord, let him deliver him. Seeing he delighted in him, this very thing the Pharisees said at the foot of the cross, challenging Christ to come down. If you're the son of God, prove it, show us. They shall part his garments amongst them, and upon his vesture they shall cast lots from the Psalms. In his sufferings he shall exclaim, O God, my God, look upon me, why hast thou forsaken me? Christ uttered these words from the cross. He shall be slain, said Daniel, and the people that deny him shall not be his. So he would be rejected by his own people, as the prophets foretold, but those that put him to death would not be his own people. Of course, it was the Romans that actually executed him. It's astonishing how clear and minute are the prophecies of the Redeemer. You see them, especially when you read the, the Gospels of St. Matthew and of St. John, they more than the others point out the fulfillment of these prophecies throughout the pages of the gospel. Some of these prophecies were made over a thousand years before Christ was born. His resurrection, ascension, and the descent of the Holy Ghost, the destruction of Jerusalem, the rejection of the Jews, the conversion of the Gentiles, the propagation of the gospel, and the perpetuity of the church were also foretold. For David foretold, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor wilt thou give thy Holy One to see corruption. He would be slain, as David and the other prophets foretold. He would be put to death, but his body would not be corrupted. His soul would not be left there, but he would rise again. David foretold his ascension, saying, thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive, that is, the souls that were still in limbo waiting for the redemption is led the captives forth. Joel, the prophet, foretold the descent of the Holy Ghost, saying, and it shall come to pass after this that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Moreover, upon my servants and handmaids in those days, I will pour forth my spirit. Daniel prophesied that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. He said that Christ shall be slain and the people that deny him shall not be his. And the people with their leader that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be waste. This is, of course, speaking of the Romans. And after the end of the war, 
the appointed desolation. And he shall confirm the covenant with many in one week, and in the half of the week the victim and the sacrifice shall fail. It is the sacrifices of the old covenant. And there shall be in the temple the abomination of desolation, and the desolation shall continue even to the consummation and to the end. This destruction of the temple, this ending of the sacrifices of the Mosaic law, would last until the end of the world. We spoke about that a little bit last week as well. This, of course, was, again, mentioned by Christ when he foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. This speaks about the rejection of the Jewish people, the ending of the covenant, the ending of the sacrifices. This is exactly what happened. That the, that the Gentiles should receive, that should be converted and receive, that Christ would come to them as well, is foretold by several places. All the ends of the earth shall remember and shall be converted to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the Gentiles adore in his sight. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall have dominion over the nations. The new covenant was not to be just with the Jewish people. It was to be to the whole earth to the Gentiles, as well as to the Jews. In the Psalms, all kings of the earth shall adore him, all nations serve him. After speaking of the four great empires of the world, that is of Babylon, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, Daniel said of the kingdom of Christ, that is the church, in those days of those kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And his kingdom shall not be delivered up to another people, and it shall break in pieces and shall consume all these kingdoms, and itself shall stand forever. Now what other kingdom, what other nation, what other empire has lasted more than a thousand years or two thousand years? None. With all the might of the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, and all the other empires and kingdoms that have ever existed, they are all passed away, and the church has not from its establishment, and we know will last until the end of time. As I said, there are over 300 prophecies pertaining to Christ, and as one mathematician figured out the probabilities of all of these things, all of these prophecies apl applying to Christ... <laughs> And he said, you know, if you were to take eight of these prophecies and work out the probabilities, it'd be one in ten times, uh, one in ten with 17 zeros after it. And he said, to give you an example, you could fill the state of Texas with two feet of uh, silver dollars and uh, blindfold you and give you one chance to pick this one special coin. That's the probability of eight of those prophecies being fulfilled not the 300. It's absolutely impossible, but, but by God. On this third Sunday of Advent, Gaudete Sunday, the church bids us to rejoice because the coming of Christ is nearer. We rejoice because the Messiah has already come and we enjoy the fruits of the redemption, the new covenant, but the church bids us to rejoice on this, this particular Advent because the graces of Christmas, the graces of that holy day, are nearer. We're more than halfway through the season of Advent. But the church does not bid us to rejoice as do the pagans. It does not bid us to rejoice as those who do not fear God, who refuse any obligation or any duty to their creator. Just as the prophecies of Christ show the wonder, the glory, the power, the goodness of God and becoming man and redeeming us, yet the prophecies always all also speak of the rejection of Christ, the sad and, and somber refrain of his death, of his sufferings, of his rejection. And we 
We can look to those who reject Christianity. We can look to the Jews and to the pagans and to the Muslims and to other denominations and say, they just don't get it. They just don't get it. They reject Christ. They won't look at the evidence. They won't look at these prophecies. They won't accept the miracles, the resurrection of Christ. And we shake our heads, and rightly so. The evidence is astounding and overwhelming and indisputable. So we rightly say that, but we also must look at ourselves because in our own way, we reject Christ when we sin, when we fail in our duties and our obligations. Christ is not just this fanciful person that lived 2,000 years ago and was really wise and gave us some good advice. Christ is God. And his commandments are not suggestions, they are commands. God, who knows all things and sees all things, looks to us, each individually, as to whether we accept or reject Christ in our minds, in our wills, in our lives. That's the point of our Advent season, is to remind ourselves of the preparation that God had for the coming of the Messiah. All of the signs and indications, all of the prophecies that point to Christ as the Messiah, as truly God made man. And we're reminded of his perfect fulfillment of every single one of them. Of redeeming us, yes. But it's not a redemption that leads to this license that I can just do whatever I want now. Rather, it is a call to us to follow him to do penance for our sins, to correct the faults, the sins, the mistakes that we make, so that we can follow after him closely. He has given us very clear indications of what he expects of us, what he wants of us. And he also has given very clear indications of what happens if we reject that, if we turn away from him. The rejection of the Jewish people, the destruction of Jerusalem, the judgment that was passed upon them, as a reminder to us of what will happen to us, who have the clear, not the signs and the prefigurements of the Old Testament, but the clear indications, the clear fulfillment of Scripture, the, the testimony of the apostles of the miracles of Christ, of the resurrection, of the divinity. We know him. We accept him as God, as our Messiah. But to what extent does that influence our lives? That is what Advent is about, is answering that question. What things ought we to do better? What things do we need to stop? Because in their own way, whether they be in slight or in serious ways, they are a rejection of Christ. They're an echo of Satan's cry that I will not serve. An echo of the Jews crying out, we have no king but Caesar. We do not accept God's dominion. We accept the dominion of the earthly kings and of material things. This is why the church bids us to do penance. Because by our penance, we show our love for God. We deny ourselves detach our will a little bit, at least a little bit more from our own self-love and our attachment to the things of this world. And if we open up by prayer and penance, if we do make room for Christ, then his visitation will have a similar effect as it did 2,000 years ago. But as he was lifted up, he would draw all things to him. Our hearts, our wills can be drawn after Christ, but only if we make room for him. Let us set about that. We have one more week till Christmas. It is a day of special grace for those who are open to it, who make room, who make ready for his coming. Let us spend this last week well in preparing for the visitation of Christ, the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.